So folks, like a cow in tall grass, I am utterly tickled to be here with you today. <laughs> uh, this morning went, when I went to get coffee, someone asked me what I was doing in Riverton, and, and when I explained to them that I was giving a talk at a TED event, this uh, excruciating expression came over their face, and they said, well, you must be smarter than you look. Uh, <laughs> And the ironic thing is that my wife had to explain that to me. Uh, <laughs> so one of my earliest memories as a child is, is, uh, is of my mom defrosting our refrigerator. And, you know, the contents of the rub were spread out all over the kitchen. And that bright yellow door was propped open. I walked outside and I walked down a row of tobacco that was way taller than I was. I, I came to a row of tomatoes and I picked a green one. And my great-grandpa was watching nearby. Uh, my cousins playing also nearby stopped and, and watched as my great-grandpa approached me because if they were caught picking something that wasn't ripe, their punishment would be eating that sour fruit. Uh, he took pity on a three-year-old, however, and, and gently explained to me that I should only pick the red ones and only when I'm hungry. He took a salt shaker from a fence post nearby and he sprinkled salt over two red ripe tomatoes uh, for us to eat. My cousins went back to climbing live oak trees and, and trying to catch sheep with snares made from baling twine. I was, uh, I was the last of four generations to live there. Our three homes were a stone's throw from one another. I, I would come to know later that my great grandpa, my grandpa, my dad, all three, this for violence when it was required, but I knew right away that they all possessed this extraordinary degree of tenderness. It was one that allowed them to deliver lambs, to, to nurse fragile seedlings, and to blow softly on a scrape on my knee after they cleaned it with Bactine. It was warm then, and my belly was full, and I was surrounded by people who loved me. Um, but everything has a winter, and I can see my aunt the day that her horse died and she was weeping. I can see grandpa driving his backhoe out to the pasture to dig a hole for that horse's final resting place. I was beginning to learn about heartache and shortly thereafter our great grandpa Martin got sick. He was 91 years old. Every year on his birthday he did pull-ups on the clothesline. <clears throat> He chewed tobacco for the majority of his life. Uh, only in about 1960, he quit spitting. So it was an ulcer that was probably long overdue, if I'm being honest, that took him from us. But we all cried at that point. In hindsight, though, it, it was... Uh, he left nothing undone. He was born just before the turn of the century. He watched tractors replace mules, the advent of the automobile. He built airplanes for Ryan Aeronautical. He had 13 grandkids. It was a good, long, and full life that I'm proud of. Then not so many years ago, it was Grandpa Wilson's turn to go out to pasture. Uh, we all traveled to say our goodbyes. He was born on an obscure farm in Iowa. In California, he became a community and a civic leader. He married Patricia. He had eight successful kids. <clears throat> there was likewise nothing in his long life left undone. Toward the end, he laid in his hospital bed that a, a home health nurse put up in the office. And days before he departed, um, my dad sat next to him. John, which is my dad's name, Grandpa called out, John, my dad listened intently, and, and expecting his, his father's octogenarian insight when he said, you know what, John, I should have never planted <clears throat> those poplars in the bottom ground. Now, uh, Lombardi poplars are these tall columnar trees, and they make a magnificent windbreak. You can see them around the south end of Utah County if you guys are driving that way home around all the orchards, but they can't have invasive roots, and that can be kind of a nuisance if they're nearby ground that needs to be plowed often. I, you know, having been removed from that situation for a little while, I think it's kind of funny that uh, as his heart's rhythm waned and he drew his last breath, he was still thinking about those trees. I'd love to be able to tell you where we as individuals and, and agriculture as an occupation begins, but 
I, like my grandfather, have absolutely no idea. So the question is, what would inspire a person to work insufferable hours, to teeter on the brink of emotional exhaustion and physical fatigue and financial ruin for that matter? That's not a rhetorical question, by the way. If you guys could let me know why we do that, that would be great. Uh, I do have an idea, and it has something to do with the fact that in the morning, I count my breaths as I face the east, and I watch the sun come over the hills, and, and it turns the horizon from gray to pink and orange before it warms our valley. And as I stand there on that dew-soaked soil, I can feel myself as part of the planet on which we ride. That, I suppose, is why. There's this natural-born fondness in us for changing the world. And some of us take it literally. We yearn for there to, to be something verdant and bursting with life where there was nothing before. And we look for a fallow field around, in every, around every corner. We look for an opportunity to take something and to make it better. We have this hope and this conviction, farmers do, that there will be fruit from our labors, that we'll succeed. It's a hope that's substantiated by the fact that we will now and forever accept responsibility for what needs to be done. And the conviction is born out of having weathered life's winters when they've come far too soon and they've lasted much too long. After each winter, we start over again. And we begin with the hope for a good year, for, year upon, for row upon perfect row. We want things to go exactly as planned. And then as time erodes away at our vision of how things ought to be, we have to reconcile with all those factors that cause things to go wrong, not least of all our own imperfections. And then we say, we did the best we could. And we say that we did the best we could not because we're demoralized. We don't accept that because we accept failure. But we accept it because we understand that excellence is not a singular event, that it's a progress, that it's a process, We don't live on farms, we live in them. We are part of that process and we are not objects upon which that process acts. And it's a process that, although obviously rife with grief and hardship, we love. So one morning, a, a short time ago, I was walking through the field east of my home and twice in the last year, floodwaters have run across that field's gentle slope and. It's stripped away topsoil and it's deposited rocks and debris. And I looked down with a furrowed brow, upset about the fact that there was all of these things that I had not planned on, that I did not want there. And I stared down at my feet for a long time, taking special care to not trip over those obstacles. When I looked up again, though, I saw that the glint of the newly risen sun on my home, and I saw the pale green buds of the willow tree in my yard, <clears throat> and I saw these little golden liquid drops of dew hanging on everything. And as I began to walk towards my home on the horizon, my stride lengthened. Without any care given to those obstacles underfoot, I didn't stumble at all. And so it is that when... Our perspective begins to include things that are outside of those problems immediately before us. We start to inhabit a place in time. And when there is a place to which we belong, not unlike a family, we care for it. We nurture it. We offer support. We prune trees and we read bedtime stories. We are self-sufficient. We don't outsource our affections. There's this perspective that when you work in agriculture that allows you to overcome those things directly in front of you. We can see far and wide. At night, I can see the city lights when they glow 40 miles to the south of me. And I can see the cattle on the hills to the west and I can see the deer jump over my fence every evening. 
those possibilities outside of what are directly in front of us are what keep me going. It, my journey back to agriculture began at the end of the real estate bubble. I can remember sitting on the sofa in my slacks as a recent graduate and hearing my wife and daughter outside playing on the front porch, but I was so stressed out, my head wasn't with them, and, and certainly my heart was someplace else. I remember obsessing over whether or not a decision I made would be perceived as either beneficial or ruinous to those subjective arbiters who worked in the bank. And I remember honestly wondering if my decisions made any difference at all. Uh, the fate of my ideas didn't exist in any sort of reality with concrete consequences. The world for which I longed was one where at the end of the day I looked down on my arms and they throbbed with exhaustion and I laid my pillow down at night and I fell into a, a sleep that I deserved because I earned it. It was one where there were unambiguous consequences for my decisions, the successes and the failures alike. It was one, however, where I would probably be poor and therefore one I could not choose deliberately for my family. But the recession came along and chose for me. And the anxiety and the uncertainty that came with, un with unemployment were so overwhelming for me. I remember staring down at my feet, uh, anticipating those obstacles upon which I was sure I would stumble, and I imagined the embarrassment of my falling. I imagined the pain it would cause the people who stood on my shoulders. I couldn't see an end in sight. There wasn't any course or path that I was aware of that would improve my plight. Uh, and to be honest with you, I'm still not sure when things turned around. I want very much to be able to tell people who are under a heavy burden that there's a point just around the corner where your pain recedes and your perspective begins to include the horizon it, uh, again, but we won't see it and, and we never will until we get there. Day after day, we, we, uh, we toil in the throes of challenge after challenge, growing all the while. When I put a seed in the ground, despite my excitement and anticipation, I can't see it grow. We grow because it's in our constitution as human beings. It's hardwired in us, just like it's hardwired in a sunflower, to face the east faithfully every morning. I was in a conference this last winter, and I was listening to a, another farmer tell a story, and, and uh, she referred to agriculture as a birth defect, which is an idea that's, that has a lot of truth to it, frankly. Uh, but I have no doubt that whatever passion I have for excellence today is due in large part to watching those that came before me. And, and so I, I don't have any doubt that my passions required for the survival of our civilization going forward. And that my passions required to inspire my kids so that they can do work that is important to them in a place to which they feel they belong. Work which might be considered by its beneficiaries, as it often is, to be arcane and empty-headed, and, and work that is frankly so hard sometimes you wonder if they're right. Even so, like that mist that clung to the ground overnight, we rise every morning, and our rising is not momentous or grandiose. It's not a claim to the world being ours for the taking. What it is, is gently and perennial, perennially looking upward, and sometimes with a tear in your eye, and sometimes with a mischievous grin, but saying, I am here and I'm not going anywhere. And if we say I'm here for long enough, we'll be able to look back on the growing season, even our season here on earth, and see a field finally ripe with fruit, and we'll be able to say we did good. And I think these values aren't necessarily exclusive to agriculture. They're not really farm values. They're the finest human values, and so I think it's important that we preserve them. I thank you guys for coming, and I'll see you around.